Feel the power. Welcome to Righteous Invasion of Truth with Dr. Abel Damina. Welcome to the ever increasing world feast. I'm excited to welcome you, friends and family, right here on Facebook, YouTube, and all our social media handles. Abel Damina is my name. Listen, the truth of the word of God is when God's word is preached and taught, God's power to save is made available. Brother Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation. I'm honored to serve you grace today to bring you clarity of teaching from the word of God. Invite a friend, a loved one, create watch parties, tag people because the word is going to come very hot and powerful today. You know, there's a mandate of God on my life to reintroduce Jesus to this generation, equipping the believer to know who you are in Christ, what you have in Christ, and what Christ can do through you. It is with that mandate in mind that this message is coming to you right now. It will change your life forever. However, remember the scripture tells us the time shall come when they shall not endure sound doctrine. The Greek word hugaino wholesome doctrine. There's an endurance required. So as you listen, please painstakingly and patiently listen to the teaching of God's word. Don't listen with a critical mind. Listen with a mind to learn. You know, Jesus said, learn of me for I am meek and lowly of heart and you shall find rest. So there's a meekness required. Brother James says, with meekness, receive the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. There's a meekness required and there's endurance required where sound doctrine is concerned. So you want to patiently follow the teachings. Most of my teachings are in a series. So get ready to follow. And if there's anything you don't understand, be patient. The teachings will continue to explain themselves until you come to a place of understanding and clarity in the knowledge of Christ. One more thing to say with you today. If you're in an area where there's no Bible teaching church, where the message of Christ like this is preached, you can start one or you can join any of our campuses. Our campuses are extension houses of our local church where brethren come together and they are fed, they are taught, they take responsibility, they pray together, they reach out to the people in their community with the truth of God's word. Our campuses are lighthouses in nations and cities and communities where believers come together and they are taught the word of God by myself. And I'm excited if you want to be a part of what we're doing around your community or you want to start one. All you need to do is shoot me a mail today, Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com. And we shall guide you on what to do to either begin one campus or join another. It's not good for you to be in isolation. The Bible says, do not dismiss the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. In prophecy, the word of God tells us that God will bring the solitary into families. You are a member of a family and there is no family that does not have a gathering. Our gathering is our assemblage to be taught, to be equipped, and to become responsible for other people's growth. It's so important, and I'm looking forward to hearing from you today. Lastly, there's a plethora of books I have written that addresses so many issues of the Christian faith. They're all on the screen. Look at this. Today, you can order for a book or two or all the set by shooting an email to Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com. Including today's message, you can order for the CD or the DVD. The entire essence is to nourish you, enrich you, and equip you with robust understanding of your relationship with Almighty God. I'm excited to be able to serve you. Fasting your seatbelts. Let me take you right now into a gospel adventure, into the service where the spirit of our God is already moving. Happy viewing. Revelation chapter 1 verse 1. Let's look at the theme of the book of Revelation. The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him. So it's the revelation of Jesus which God gave to John. So everything we're going to read in Revelation is the revelation of Jesus. And of course you know that the revelation of Jesus is not complete until the believer in him is made manifest. So the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. So before John begins to talk about the visions and all the different metaphors that he saw and all the angels that he saw, he first of all established the position of the believer in verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is a faithful witness, 
and the first begotten of the dead. So he tells you emphatically that the Jesus is about to unveil in this scripture is the risen Lord. Jesus, the one who rose from the dead, not the incarnate Christ, not Jesus of Nazareth, but the risen Lord, the Jesus who defeated death, the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth. Now watch this. Unto him that loved us, and washed us from our sins in his own blood. So he establishes your position that you're already loved. You're already washed. There's nothing you will do anymore to be more loved. He has loved you already with an everlasting love. He has washed you with his blood. Next verse. And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. So whatever John is going to talk about in Revelation will be based on this doctrinal position. There's nothing he will say anymore that will contradict this position. This is our status. We are loved. And that love is demonstrated in his death. And out of his death we are washed. And because we are washed we are made kings and priests unto God. That is who we are. There's nothing John is going to talk about anymore in Revelation that will unsettle that position. So that's why before talking about the visions and the dreams and the things he saw, he first of all reassures the believer that in him you are loved. In him you are washed. In him you are a king and a priest. Your salvation is secured. Your status in Christ is guaranteed. He loved us. He washed us. He made us. Somebody say very loud with me. I am loved. I am washed. I am made a king and a priest unto my God. Can I hear a powerful amen? All right. So now he begins to talk about the angels of the seven churches. Revelation 120. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sowest in my right hand. And the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven candlesticks which thou sowest are the seven churches. So he talks about the angels of the seven churches. The word angels is from the Greek word agelos. A-G-G-E-L-O-S. Agelos. Which implies messenger or messengers. An envoy. Or one who is sent. An angel. It is vital to know that the word angelos is not always used for celestial beings. Sometimes it is used for men. For example, Mark 1 2. As it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. My messenger, the word angelos. In this context, John the Baptist was the angel or the messenger. Mark 1, 3 to 4. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John did baptize in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. So John is the messenger here. The same word, Agelos. Okay? John the Baptist. Messenger of God. Alright? Luke seven twenty four. And when the messengers of John were departed, he began to speak unto the people concerning John. What went he out into the wilderness for to see? A reed shaking with the wind. The messengers of John or the angels of John. Meaning the disciples of John. Look at verse 27. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. My messenger. Alright? Talking about angelos the difference is that john's disciples were messengers of john and john himself was a messenger of god but the same word was used for both john and his disciples angelos all right luke 9 51 and 52 and it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up he steadfastly set his face to go to jerusalem and sent messengers angelos messengers before his face and they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. In the scripture we just read, the Samaritans sent messengers. Agelos, same word. Galatians 4.14. And my temptation which was in my flesh you despised not, nor rejected, but received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. 
So Paul referred to himself here as an angel, a messenger of God, not a celestial being. James 2.25 Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way. The messengers, those spies, okay? Historically, the messenger in this context were the spies that Joshua sent to spy out Canaan. Look at where it is originally written. Joshua chapter 2 verse 1. And Joshua the son of Nun sent out of Shittim two men to spy secretly saying, Go view the land, even Jericho. And they went and came into an Halot's house named Rahab and lodged there. These messengers were those spies that were sent by Joshua. So it is clear that the word Ejelos in the Bible was not always in reference to celestial beings. So every time you read the word angel, you need to find out in that context what it is really referring to. Is it referring to humans or is it referring to celestial beings? So, very important because that will help you understand what the context is communicating. So, the same applies to the word angels in the book of Revelation written by John as messengers. The angels, messengers. Notice very carefully that the author, which is John, intelligently made a distinction when he used the word angelos in the book of Revelation. In talking about celestial beings, he used prefixes and suffixes for a jealous. For example, look at this very clearly. Revelation chapter 1 verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And is sent and signified by his angel. You will see some suffixes and prefixes there. Look at Revelation 3, 5. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. But I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Revelation 12, 9. And the great dragon was cast out that old serpent called the devil and Satan which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels. Look at Revelation 14.10. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels. Revelation 22 verse 6. And he said unto me, these sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophet sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly come to pass. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. So take note of the word he is the angel. Verse 16 of 22. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. Mine angel, his angel, the holy angel, he used that to identify with the celestial beings. He didn't just call them angels. All right. He used his, mine, holy angels when he's dealing with celestial beings. All right. However, when he referred to men, he used the suffixes of the seven churches. The church of or the angel of. When he's referring to men. The angel of. When he's referring to angels. Holy angels. He is holy angels. Mine angel. He is angel. For example, look at Revelation chapter 2 verse 1. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus. Right. Now he's talking about humans. He's not talking about celestial beings. Revelation chapter 2 verse 8. And unto the angel of the church in Simna. Right. Talking about humans. Revelation 2 12. And to the angel of the church in Pagamos. Right. See the way he uses the word for humans. Revelation 2.18. And unto the angel of the church in Theatra, right. Look at Revelation 3.1. And unto the angel of the church in Sardis, right. Revelation 3.7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, right. Revelation 3.16. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither could nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. 3.14. And unto the angel of the church in Laodiceans, right. When he's dealing with humans, it's different the way he uses it. When he spoke about celestial beings, he referred to the things that he saw and heard. However, he wrote to the angels of the seven churches. The angel of the seven churches are servants, messengers of God. 
who function as the leadership of the seven churches to whom the Lord instructed John to write the letters to. Physical leadership. All right? Physical leadership. The angels of the church. All right? So John wrote the letter to the leadership. Number two, the angel of the Lord or his or mine angel were messengers of the Lord who are celestial beings that John had interactions with in his vision on the Isle of Patmos. Now, so let's begin quickly. The letter to the church in Simna, Revelation 2.8. And unto the angel of the church in Simna write this thing, save the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. Pay attention. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of these things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried, and you shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. That already tells you the man that is born again. Because the man that is born again has passed from death to life. So he that overcometh is he that is born again. Now, let's pick out the lessons. There is a phrase there we read. But before I deal with the phrase, first of all, God gives to this church words of commendation. Based on their present circumstances. They were in the midst of tribulation poverty and persecution and he told them not to fear he told them to remain faithful despite all that they're going through so it was a letter of encouragement and note that he did not have any word of rebuke for this church no rebuke at all no rebuke no wonder they were going through tribulation and trials because once you stick to the purity of the gospel of christ tribulation and trials begin to come so this church were going through tribulation and trials because they were sticking to the doctrine of God's word. The purity of the gospel without compromise and without, you know, trying to make it sound nice. And then the phrase, crown of life. Crown of life. Translated from the Greek word, Stephanos Zoe. It was the same phrase used by James. James 1.12. Blessed is the man that endured temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life. Stephanos Zoe, which the Lord had promised to them that love him. And Paul related the same similar experience when he wrote his letter to Timothy. 2 Timothy 4, verse 7. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love is appearing. How many of you love is appearing? If your love is appearing, say, I love is appearing. To love is appearing means I'm doing everything I need to do to make him come fast. I love is appearing doesn't mean I love is appearing. No, I love is appearing means I'm engaging in evangelism, soul winning. I want to get the gospel to the ends of the earth so that he will come fast. That is what it means to love is appearing. Not to sit in church and be comfortable. You don't care whether people are born again or not. As long as you're writing all the Greek words with all their grammatical analysis and you're growing in knowledge, you're okay. No, no, that's not how to love is appearing. To love is appearing means I want him to come. Therefore, because I love his appearing and I want him to show up, I'm going to get the word out. I'm going to get the work done. Because remember, the context is, I have fought a good fight. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, it's laid for me a crown because of what I've done. And it's not for me alone. For all those that are doing what I have done to hasten his appearing. He's not talking about sitting in church and feeling nice. You don't care whether people are born again or not. You come to church, you're happy that you finally managed to arrive. No, that's not what it means. Loving his appearing is committed to the assignment. Getting busy with the work. Somebody shout glory. glory. Touch your neighbor say we lighten the dark places. 
of the earth. Touch your neighbor, say, we're lightening the dark places of the earth. Say, I love his appearing. Say it like you know what you're talking about. Say, I love his appearing. Say it very loud, I love his appearing. Say it louder, I love his appearing. There's no reward for church attendance. The reward is for what? For ministry. For ministry. That's why the essence of church is so I can equip you. Once you are equipped, what is the next thing? Ministry. Ministry. For the work of the ministry. Zakutana. For the work of the ministry. Henceforth is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them that love is appearing. Hallelujah. So he explains that this crown of life is the reward of their work. The reward of their work. And like I said, if you observe carefully, this is the only church up till this point that God didn't say, I have anything against you. The church in Simna. Let's look at the church in Pagamos. Revelation 2.12. 12. And the angel of the church in Pagamos write, This thing saith he which are the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful Matthias, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee. Because thou hast dear them that hold the doctrine of Balaam. Who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel. To eat things, sacrifice unto idols, and to commit fornication. So has thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. All right? So this is the church in Pagamos. First of all, words of commendation. Their faithfulness, all right, in defending the faith. They have not given up the faith, holding fast his name. Even when one of them was killed, they took one of them in the church by persecution and killed him. It didn't deter them from following and from defending and from proclaiming with a loud voice the message. In spite of what they were going through. And God says, I know your works. I have seen your steadfastness. I have seen how much you have survived in the midst of tribulation. I have seen that where you are is Satan's seat. But you have not denied the faith. In spite of trials. In the midst of so much persecution. You have withstood your ground. That's how it started. However, verse 14, he has a few things against them, all right? Now, that phrase against is from the Greek word kata, K-A-T-A. It implies, I have a few things contrary to you. I have observed a few things that are contrary to you. In other words, he spotted a defect that does not belong to the church. Something strange was going on in that congregation, a defect. What were the strange things? Verse 14. It is the doctrine of Balaam. Number one. And we shall examine what is the doctrine of Balaam. Number two. The doctrine of the Nicolaitans. In verse 15. The word doctrine in the above text is translated from the Greek word didache. D-I-D-A-C-H-E. Which implies what has been taught or what has been instructed. So there was a teaching and there was an instruction going on in this church in Pagamos. So the issue he had was concerning doctrine. They had a doctrinal issue. And if you observe, the same thing with the church at Ephesus. 
the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, the teaching. So the problem God had with the church at Ephesus and the church at Pagamos were doctrinal issues. Doctrinal issues. The doctrine of Balaam and the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. And we're going to examine what are these doctrines because when we examine, you find out that these doctrines are running all over the place wild in so many so-called churches. And God says, I hate it. So what is this doctrine? The doctrine of Balaam and the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. So this rebuke was concerning false teaching in the local church, which they were supposed to repent from. A false teacher is known by what he says. A false teacher is known by what he says. A false teacher. While a good local church is known by the quality of what is taught. A good local church is known by the quality of what is taught. A good local church is built on teaching. Not drama. Not razzmatazz. Not activity. A good local church is known by the quality of diet served. By the quality of food that is taught or communicated to believers. That's how you know a good church. And a false teacher is known by what he says. A false teacher is a man that twists the scriptures. And make the scriptures say what the scriptures are not saying. That's a false teacher. When somebody stands up and say, if you don't pay your tithe, you will go to hell, full stop. That is a false teacher. That is a false teacher. Because it is not consistent with the doctrine of scripture. In fact, it is not even in the Old Testament. Even the Old Testament, where he's bringing it from, there is no attachment to tithe that guarantees eternal life. From Genesis... It has been the lamb of God that will take away sin. From Genesis, it has always been the lamb of God. Because even in Eden, there was the tree of life, which was Christ. So all through the scripture, it has always been that eternal life will be in a person, not in an activity. So when a teacher of the word say, if you don't pay your tithe, you will go to hell. It's a false teacher. False teachers are known by what they say, not what they wear, and not miracles, signs, and wonders. Because watch, 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 watch. Anybody can do miracles. Miracles are not exclusive to Christianity. They are not exclusive to us. I'm not saying we don't do miracles. I believe in miracles. Okay? I've come across people all over the place. Even right here in this church, who have had miracles in services without anybody making a big deal about it. We don't advertise miracles because we are not showmen. We amplify the world because that is our assignment. We don't have time to be advertising miracles. Oh, this brother could not work well. After we prayed, he has started working well. No, miracles are a lifestyle for a believer. Once we show you who you are, you walk in the miraculous. So it's not supposed to be a special feature. No, it's not supposed to be a special feature in the church. Of course, it can be a special feature in the crusade ground. Because in the crusade ground, we want to show them the goodness of God. But within the local church, miracles are not supposed to be a big deal. They are supposed to be part of our lives as believers. Because a believer is a supernatural person. And in the supernatural, miracles are natural. You didn't hear what I said. A believer is a supernatural person. And in the supernatural, miracles are natural. They are not a special event. They are part of our lifestyle. First of all, even your birth is a miracle. Even your birth, born again, is a miracle. So you began from miracle. You continue in miracles. You end in miracles. So a good local church is known by teaching. The quality of teaching that goes on there. The quality of teaching. And let me be honest with you. When you encounter good Bible teaching, the moment you encounter good Bible teaching, it is difficult for you to settle for junk. Very difficult. Very difficult. In fact, impossible. 
I come across people who are not in this physical congregation who just follow me on YouTube, Facebook, and all that. And they say, Papa, we can't go to church again. Because when we sit down, what they are saying is no more registering. And the good thing about this is once you hear the right word, and because you are born of God, there's a witness that tells you this is what you should be hearing. And once that witness registers that this is where you belong, you have been shown your level. Anything below that is like eating with pigs. The prodigal son said, why am I eating with pigs? Let me go back to my father's house. So the moment you hear the right word, there's a witness. And once that witness witnesses, it will be difficult for you to settle for less. Very difficult. After all, church is not a location. Church is a person. You are the church. You are the church. When you live here, the church has left. When we gather on Wednesday, the church has assembled. You are the church of the living God. I, I don't know if you're hearing what I'm saying. See, this is not the church. You are the church. Your body is the temple. And I will build my upon a rock. And the gates of hell. So you have been built a spiritual house. The devil cannot prevail against you. Why? You are a product of resurrection. When Jesus rose, you rose. What could not defeat him cannot defeat you. So when we gather, the church has come together. When we part, the church has gone their separate ways. But every one of you is the church of God. You are the temple. You are God's tabernacle. You are God's tabernacle. Just like it was in the Old Testament. Spirit, soul, and body. Okay? You are also spirit, soul, and body. Outer court, inner court, holy of holies. You are the tabernacle of God. And what God has done in Christ has been completed in you. But your mind needs to acknowledge it. And then there's one more thing, the redemption of your body, which makes you a complete tabernacle of God, perfected in the finished work. So don't let anybody tell you a church is somewhere. You are the church. You are God's tabernacle. You are the new Jerusalem. You are the holy city. You are the bride of Christ. Oh, glory to God. Somebody's not excited here this morning. So let's get to work. Let's get to work. A good local church is known by the quality of what is taught. We examine the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. And we say that doctrine of the Nicolaitans is a doctrine that emphasizes a pseudo gospel. Okay? And I will open it up in a second. But let's look quickly at the doctrine of Balaam. What is the doctrine of Balaam? Revelation 2.14. But I have a few things against it because... Thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam. Who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel. To eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. It is critical to understand what was said and not to imagine or read a meaning into it. So let's do some exegesis. The word stumbling block. The Greek word for stumbling block is the word skandalon. Which implies a... Uh, snare or a trap the issue here is Balaam taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel historically he did it by them eating food offered to idols and committing fornication let's go back to where it came from historically numbers 25 1 to 3 and Israel abode in Shittim and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab and they called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods. And the people did eat and bow down to their gods. And Israel joined himself unto Baal poor. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. This was what was referred to historically as the council of Balaam. Look at Numbers 31, 16. Behold, this caused the children of Israel through the council of Balaam. To commit trespass against the Lord in the matter of poor. And there was a plague among the congregation of the people. Peter also spoke about the way of Balaam. Second Peter 2 Peter 2.14-15 to 15, Having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin. Beguiling unstable souls and hearts they have exercised with covetous practices. Cause children which are forsaken the right way. And are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bosor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. Notice his words. 
beguiling unstable souls and heart they have exercised with covetous practices a heart they have exercised with covetous practices jude also talked about balaam jude 1 11 woe unto them for they have gone in the way of cain and ran greedily after the error of balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of call notice his words ran greedily after the error of balaam for a reward reward emphasized for a reward so the doctrine of balaam is a teaching in the local church the doctrine of balaam is a teaching in the local church all right this teaching that we call the doctrine of balaam is a teaching that inspires believers into covetousness and greed the doctrine of balaam which will eventually beguile them and cause them to be unstable a teaching that inspires believers into covetousness and greed i will make it i will make it i will make it i will be the richest man on it I will be the richest man on it. I will make it. Greed, covetousness. Greed, covetousness. Messages that are materialistic. How to make it. Entrepreneur skills in the church. Ten steps to success. Messages that make you feel that if you don't have financial breakthrough, God is not happy with you. Messages that make you feel that the approval of God is that you joined this church just one month ago. Now you have a jeep. Messages that inspire greed and covetousness. That's the doctrine of Balaam. And it's in many churches. Many Christians cannot come to church except it's a breakthrough service. Greed, covetousness. Messages that make you feel that you are not a success if you are not driving a Toyota Camry. Messages that make you feel that you are not with God if you don't buy a car, build a house before the year is over. So, Father, I will not let you go till you bless me. Those messages, they inspire greed. They make believers steal in their offices. They make believers get involved with fraudulent things so that they too can belong to the camp of those that testify that God is in them. It's a doctrine. It's a teaching. It is called the doctrine of Balaam. The doctrine of Balaam. And God said, I hate it. And he said to that church in Pagamos, this kind of teachings are going on in your congregation. Can you imagine a particular church every Sunday is entrepreneurial service. Every Sunday there is entrepreneurial service. Is that the mission of the church? And somebody said, God has told me to raise millionaires. Which verse? Which verse from, except is a Bible I have not read. I have not seen any verse in the Bible that say we should raise millionaires. But I have seen a verse that say we should equip believers to do the work of ministry. We are not here to raise millionaires. We are here to raise believers. We are here to raise an army for God. That will preach the gospel of Christ. An army that will preach the message of salvation. Because the gospel is the power of God. Unto salvation. We are not here to raise millionaires. We are not here to raise millionaires. We are here to raise people. That are Christ like. People that are reflecting Christ. I've never seen a verse that says we should raise millionaires. It's not in the Bible. And it is not what the apostles handed over to us. No. It's not historical Christianity. And it's not apostolic teaching. The raising of millionaires. Don't you want you to be millionaires? You should be millionaires. Because if you have money, we can do more. But that's not our teaching in this church. 
But when a church focuses on materialistic gospel, it's the doctrine of Balaam. And believers are taught to give money. And that when they give money, they will prosper. It's fraud. Fraud of the highest order. Give so you can be rich. It's fraud. They are stealing from you. They are stealing from you. There is no such promise in the scripture. If you want to make money, get a job. Get a business. Money increases when you service society. God does not multiply money. The day God starts multiplying money has become a criminal. Nigeria has an institution that manufactures money. It is called Central Bank and it is regulated. And God is not a staff of Central Bank. God is not a staff of Central Bank. So God does not interfere with the production of money. Is he jobless? That's why it is men that give to you. God doesn't give to you money. God gives you ideas and wisdom. Which has already given you. Now it is left for you to translate the ideas and wisdom into profitability. Question, question, question. Did God create the earth? Yes. Who made the chair you're sitting on? Is it God? And the man that made it, did we pay? Why did we pay him? For the chair. But how did he get the chair? From the raw material that God has kept on earth, which anybody can access and use it to serve his society. So instead of sitting down in a church and allowing a pastor feed your greed and covetousness, my brother, hear the gospel, go out, look for something to do with your hand. Any preacher who say, give me money, God will multiply it, is a thief. Did you hear what I said? What is he? He's a thief. Quote me anywhere. Quote me anywhere. It's fraud. God doesn't multiply money. Did you hear that? If God multiplies money, let me tell you the truth. I will lock the doors and keep all of you here. Whatever you have in your pocket, we will drop it. And nobody will go out for one year. Let God multiply that money so that the day we open the windows and doors and we go out, we are coming out billionaires. If that does not happen, then God does not multiply money. He that does not walk should not eat. So if you want to eat, walk. So if you want money, walk. He didn't say fast. You get a job. Clean your head. Don't let the doctrine of Balaam destroy your future. God doesn't multiply money. Say so if you go to a program somewhere, those of you that like moving around, If you go to a program somewhere and the man of good do 45 million years. 45 million years. Yeah, I see. I see. I see. I see. He's a thief. He's seen fraud. I see. I see. All right. There are 45 of you here. If you sow 100,000, you become a millionaire. Start coming out. God doesn't multiply money. And somebody says, but does God do miracles? Yes. But you two ask me, what kind of miracles? Miracles of giving you a favor with somebody who got money, who will give you? God won't produce the money. Uh -uh. Look at, the, don't you read your Bible? 5,000 hungry men in the bush. Why didn't Jesus do? Bragada and bread will fall out. Why didn't Jesus do that? He said, what do you have? They say bread and fish. He say bring it. And it happened only once. It wasn't a lifestyle. Open your hands. Say my hands will do something. My hands will do something. So, I so I can make money. The doctrine of Balaam feeds the greed and the covetousness of believers. 
Then it beguiles you and makes you unstable. Honey, you know how it makes you unstable? When now you give the money and you're waiting, and the money does not multiply, then you start wondering, God, are you really there? This thing I'm hearing, is it true? You have become unstable. It has made you unstable. It has beguiled you. Especially when the preacher promised you and swore until tears were coming out of his eye. And he collected the money. And you yourself, because you are a mumushious, when you saw tears, you believe that no matter what, this thing is going to work. Touch your neighbor say, beware of the doctrine of Balaam. Some of them, you see them on television. Every time they preach on television, breakthrough, prosperity, prosperity, breakthrough. You will never hear Christ. You will never hear the believer's authority. It's always money, breakthrough, four keys to uncommon money. 14 keys to uncommon wealth. Speed to overtake your overtakers. Uncommon sacrifice for uncommon level. See thief. You will never hear about Christ. You will never hear about eternal life. Meanwhile, what the believer has is richer than anything. We are the riches of Christ. We are the riches of Christ. Which is beyond anything this world can produce. The doctrine of Balaam. The doctrine of Balaam. A preacher will come to a service. He will say, I came to make 14 people millionaires. So the whole program that all of us have been invited to attend. Is only 14 people you are going to make millionaires. So let us go now. Let the 14 stay there. Because that means we are not a part of that program. They are working on your psychology. Meanwhile, the gospel is for everybody. But the doctrine of Balaam. And God said, I hate it. God said, in fact, Pagamos, I have something against you. You have allowed that doctrine to be peddled in your congregation. You have allowed these false teachers to bring a pseudo message that looks like a message. Listen, the gospel is not welfare. The gospel is not welfare. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. The doctrine of Balaam. Greed. Covetous. The doctrine of Balaam is the materialistic gospel. The materialistic gospel. A preacher in America said, God said that they should raise money to buy jet. They should raise money to buy jet. Are you hearing? Okay. That all of us should contribute for them to buy jet. That because they cannot fly with commercial airline. That because there are too many demons in commercial airline. And that if they fly in commercial airline, it will stop them hearing from God. So they need a private jet which will be a sanctuary. So that when they are inside the private jet, they will hear clearly. Then we that will give them the money, it is we that will stay with the demons. You are not hearing what I am saying. We that will contribute to give them the money. We can stay with demons in commercial airline. But they that are supposed to be the anointed, they cannot survive demons. But we can survive demons. So who should give who money? They should give us money. See their head. The materialistic gospel, very destructive. Very, very destructive. When your focus is money, 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 nothing money, that's when a brother will cheat a brother. And he will look at him and say, if you try, I will bind you in the spirit. He has cheated you and he's opening eye for you. Materialistic gospel. All believers after is money, 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 money. Money. And because of that, believers are full of sorrow. Sorrow all over the church. No wonder when they preach that their materialistic gospel and target you and you focus on money and you're sorrowful, they bring comedians to help you. They bring comedians Sunday morning. They bring comedians to come and entertain the goats. Since you're sorrowful, let's use comedians. To cheer you up. Then after that, we give you the same dosage. You go out, you are frustrated. You come back depressed. How can a believer be depressed? Where is the joy of salvation? This joy that I have, 
the world didn't give it to me this joy that i have the world didn't give it to me this joy that i have the world didn't give it to me the world didn't give it the world can take it away this joy that i have the world didn't give it to me this joy that i have the world didn't give it to me this joy that i have the world didn't give it to me the world didn't give it the world can take it away money no money i have joy it is, it is joy unspeakable and full of glory, full of glory, full of glory. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory. All I have has never yet been told. I have a joy, the joy of salvation. I have a joy, the joy of salvation, the joy, joy every day. Joy, joy, joy every day. Happy, 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 happy every day. Joy, joy, joy every day. The joy of salvation. Joy every day. Rejoice not that the demons are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in the book of life. Shout glory! of my life you are you mean more than this world to me I wouldn't trade you wouldn't trade you I wouldn't trade you untold you you are my everything. Kabayada. Retula Boraka Teneka. Hey, Jokayo Lelele. Masoto Bilita. Renango zoto le de gegege. Yanoka me yanoka. Jemuna gereto sakaya. Somebody shall glory. The doctrine of Balaam has no place in this church. Never. No place. We have zero tolerance for the doctrine of Balaam. See, I hear you. Our focus is on a person. What's his name? When the teaching is on material things, greed is fertilized. Covetousness. See, you are depressed because your focus has been diverted from where it should be to where it shouldn't be. Suddenly you feel that God never tried. Suddenly you feel like, God, are you even there? Of what benefit is serving you? Suddenly you are frustrated. Why? You have left the mirror. You are looking at the wrong place. Comparing themselves with themselves. That message, that's what it produces. Produces competition, greed, carnality. When all of us are seeing Christ, we are equal before Christ. All of us are equal before Christ. But once it is not Christ, we are not equal. Our equality is in Christ. Outside Christ, there's no equality. Materialistic gospel, it breeds covetousness, greed. And eventually, it beguiles believers from the truth of God's word. Paul warned very strongly against this kind of gospel, the doctrine of Balaam. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 3. If any man teach otherwise, and consent not to hold some words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to to godliness. The doctrine must be according to godliness. And the doctrine must come from the wholesome words. 
of Jesus Christ. Next verse. He is proud. Anybody that ignores the doctrine of Christ, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is what? Godliness. When your Christianity is measured by material things, what you are saying is that gain is godliness. That means you are not godly until you have a car, house, money. Otherwise, God is not with you. And in most of those churches, every Sunday, there must be three people. Hey, since I came to this church, if you know what the Lord has done for me, I have married a wife, material. I have just bought a car, material. I have just been employed. God indeed is in this place. You see you, when you measure God's presence by things, it's an insult. Because there are people who don't know God. They have three wives. They have five cars. And they have built mansions. So God must be with them. Your own is one wife. The man has three. Go one wife and you're making noise. The man has three and he's surviving with three of them. Funding all of them. And there's no quarrel in the house. You have one and you're disturbing us. Papa, you say we should marry three. Try now. <laughs> Can a man carry fire in his bosom and not be burnt? Only one wife, you're sweating. Is it two? And then three? Our testimony should not be material things. You should come out and say, praise the Lord. There is a scripture I've been working on. Finally, this morning, as I was reading, it came alive. Oh, hey, those are testimonies. Your testimony should be things that are not tangible. Things that are not corruptible. Eternal things. You know, that should be our testimony. When we gather as saints, we should tabernacle around what Christ has done. Any preacher that focuses you on material things outside Christ, run. I don't care how long he's been preaching. Flee for your life. Once a church is about money, things, clothes, the message, the songs, everything is around material things, run. You are sitting where Satan sits. Run. Don't even try to stay for a second. When you go to such churches where people celebrate things, brethren that have been there for years without a testimony, they get depressed. I've been in this church. Tight, I pay without mistake. I even used to add two naira on top in case I didn't count well. Yet nothing has changed. This one just came. And God has given him a car. God, is my name in the book of life or in the book of death? They have destabilized you in Christ because the focus is wrong. He said, I know you are poor, but you are rich. Kabayata. I know you are poor physically, but in the things of Christ, you are rich. If these material things are really what God is talking about, why don't we go with them to heaven? The day you're going to die, you carry all your car, carry all your money, put them inside your pocket. Say, okay, as you're burying me now, me and them will disappear. Next verse. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world. And it is certain we can carry nothing. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. Once you can see food to eat and cloth to wear. Whether it is designer or not designer. As long as it is cloth that will cover you. And you have food to eat. It's enough for joy. It's you that is killing yourself by comparing yourself with your classmates. Yeah. Ogale graduated just the same year with me. Ogale is the MD of a bank now. I am still the MD of an empty house. I passed by Chibuzo's house. He has married. He has two children now. And that's for women. My age mates are married. Me too, I must marry. You go and marry Satan's junior brother. The day you arrive, one eye has grown big. Because you have to marry. Who told you you must marry? Who told you? Paul didn't marry. 
And he said, a crown is laid up in heaven. Who told you you're growing old? Who is talking to you? Who are you listening to? Look at yourself in Christ. Don't be desperate for marriage. Don't be. Wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. Wait patiently. And while you are waiting, get busy with soul winning. Get busy with impact. When you are busy, you won't remember time. It's idleness that makes you count your age. Who said you will marry at 25? Who said so? Who said so? Where is it in the Bible? There are people got married at 50 and they have joy. There are people that married at 23 and they have divorced three times. Wait. Don't let African mentality destroy your covenant sense. I was telling mama yesterday that I even saw a place in the Bible where a lady is free to approach a man. Why are you looking at me? <laughs> if you like a brother, walk to him and say, I want to marry you. She shall be wasting time. <laughs> you can approach a man. Come, brother. It's like you are not seeing. Look again. God is a good God. I think we can make a home together. Receive your sight. <laughs> Glory! Stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has set you free and be not entangled again. Taste not, touch not, do not. Be not entangled with those things. Do not be entangled with those things. There are some brothers until a sister look at them and breathe on them. <sighs> Receive your sight. They will not marry till they die. There are things you shouldn't worry yourself about. Touch your neighbor, say, don't worry yourself about material things. Set your gaze on Christ. You will be sorry you worry at all tomorrow morning. Cheer up your sense of God. There's nothing to worry about. Nothing to make you feel afraid. Nothing to make you doubt. Remember, God has never failed. So why not trust him and say, you will be sorry you worry at all tomorrow morning. Hang it there. Give me the scripture. Having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. Let's be content. Once you have food to eat and clothes to wear, be happy. Be happy. Take it one day at a time. Amen. Give me the next verse. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil. Which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith. And what is the next thing? They have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after what? Righteousness and godliness and faith and love and patience and meekness. That's what our focus should be. That's what our focus should be. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Verse 19. Laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come. That they may lay hold on eternal life. O Timothy, keep that which is committed to their trust. Avoid profane and vain babblings. An opposition of science, falsely so called, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. Grace with thee. Amen. So, the doctrine of Balaam is the materialistic gospel, it's the gospel of Mammon. The doctrine of Balaam is all about money, money, money. So, a seed for the next level. Which level? Which level? I am seated in the highest place. Seated with Christ. Which other one is next level? Which other one is next level? 
Just tickling your fancy. Making a fool out of you. Which level is next level? Somebody didn't go to school. He didn't sharpen his skills. And he goes for a high technology job. And he says, I give money that will be employed. Employed to do what? To cause commotion in the system. Even if a miracle gives you the job, how will you sustain it? You lack the skill to operate it. You need skill to operate certain jobs. So instead of giving money, use it for school fees. Go and acquire a skill. Get a good job. Make money and support the work of God better. Stand up, let's close. And I speak over this house. Everybody hearing the sound of my voice. Those of you watching on Facebook, on TV, on YouTube, all our campuses. By the grace given to me by the Lord Jesus. You are free from the snare of mammonism. The hold of materialism is broken off your life. In the name of Jesus. And I decree you will never lack any good thing. By virtue of what Christ has done, you are complete in Christ. You are complete in Christ. On your job, you will be the best. In your office, you will be the best. In your career, you will be the best. By virtue of skill, you will sharpen yourself so you can be a blessing to mankind. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Your steps are ordered. Your steps are ordered. Your steps are ordered. Your steps are ordered. I decree and declare today, whatever was not working has started working for you. Grace is upon your life. What Christ has done for you, nobody will rob you of it. The finished work of Christ is complete on your inside. I command the reality of who you are to manifest. 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 We take authority over everything that is contrary to what Christ has done. We command it to expire. Expire. In the name of Jesus. You are blessed beyond the cause. You are kept by the grace of God. It is well with you. In Jesus' precious name. And every believer shout that amen on a note of final letter. Well, if you are blessed in this service, clap and celebrate what you have in Christ. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back. Oh my goodness, what a service. I know you've been blessed by the word of his grace. Please, don't go away. Don't go away. The essence of the teaching of God's word is to build you up, equip you, so you can do the work of ministry. That's the whole essence. Not just to acquire knowledge and see that, but to teach you so you can teach others. Brother Paul says, the things that you have learned of me among many witnesses, the same you commit to others who shall also commit to others. Two things. Number one, if you don't belong to a Bible teaching church where the message of Christ is taught, where the revelation of Jesus is brought to you, then you either join one of our campuses or you can begin one in your community and become the lighthouse for other believers to assemble around and be fed and be taught the word. And today you want to join either a campus of ours or you want to start a campus. All you need to do is shoot me a mail, Dr. Edel Damina at yahoo.com with your details. We shall get in touch with you and we shall work with you, equip you and train you. And we shall walk you through establishing a campus or being a part of one of our already existing campuses in your locality. Lastly, I've written a number of books to address doctrinal issues and to answer questions that you might have. They're on the screen right now. Today, if you require any of those books, you want to order for them, or all of them, or you want to order for our CDs or DVDs, shoot a mail also to Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com requesting for the materials, and our office will get in touch with you and see how they can work out getting the books to wherever you are around the world. I'm excited that I'm able to be a blessing to you today. Remember, I'm live here on Facebook every morning at 10 a.m. GMT plus 1, 12 noon GMT plus 1, 6 p.m. GMT plus 1, and 10 p.m. GMT plus 1. Many times a day, feeding you, feeding you, feeding you, equipping you, because we want you to come to a place of robust understanding of an effective relationship between you and God. Share with other people as you look forward to continuing to be a blessing in your life. And until I see you in the next broadcast, enjoy the rest of your day and be blessed. Amen. Amen to your victory station.